Okay, um, I think we will. Oops, I have destroyed everything. Yeah. I think it will probably start. I think there may be some people coming. But, um, so, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, and welcome to the train open lecture. Um, my name is Paul Goodwin, and I'm um, director of the Research Centre for Transnational Art, Identity, and Nation at the University of the Arts London. Um, and TRAIN is um, a research forum, a research community, which focuses on looking and investigating how art and design crosses borders and um, crosses cultures, and what are the politics, aesthetics, um, and issues that are associated with that. And we range across disciplines within fine art, curation, fashion, histories, fashion design, um, and we have a number of uh, members from, the, from across the University of the Arts. And um, tonight's lecture is particularly exciting for us and interesting because we have a welcoming um, Dr. Georgia Bartlett, who is uh, joining TRAIN. So we welcome Georgia um, as a new TRAIN member. And train, Georgia's membership of TRAIN means that we now have uh, a fellow or member in all of the colleges of the University of the Arts. And we're the only University of the Arts Research Centre to have that, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and welcome once again. Um, I'm going to read out some, because it's George's inaugural lecture for TRAIN, I'm going to give you quite an extensive introduction. Um, and we, we, I, I'm still myself, um, I'm very excited to come here about uh, George's research. George is currently a reader in the histories and cultures of fashion at London College of Fashion. Um, and the current research is about the relationship between Eastern European, Russian, and Western fashion, through crossing the 20th and 21st century up until today. Um, and she focuses on important modes of dress-related exchange, um, as well as the, the actors that work within that and the, and the impact of wider cultural and artistic cultures so her research very much has a cross-cultural and transnational focus. Um, and in a way, she's kind of contributing to a global fashion history. Georgia is a prolific writer and has published some several texts on the theme of fashion during socialism and post-socialism. She's the author particularly of Fashion East, The Spectre that Haunted Socialism, published by MIT Press in 2010 and also the editor of the volume on Eastern Europe, East Europe, Russia, and the Caucasus in the Berg Encyclopedia of World Dress and Fashion. Very excitingly, her, she's been funded by the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council um, on a new project which has taken her across seven countries, Austria, Czech Republic, France, Germany, Hungary, Poland, and Russia. And in this project, she's looking at uh, previously unrecorded dress-mediated discourse between East Central European and Russian fashion and its Western counterpart throughout the 20th century to, 20, to the present day. And the main outcome of this research will be published in uh, a new monograph, um, which will come out this year, or next year, next year, next year it looks like, um, which will be called European Fashion Geographies, Style, Society and Politics, so that will be blue, green, academic. Bartlett is, but uh, is also the coordinator of the Fashion, Media, and Imagery Research Hub at the London College of Fashion, um, in which capacity she's co-organized an important conference called Fashion Media, Yesterday, Today, Tomorrow, which is in 2010, and also out, as a result of that published and edited book, Fashion Media, Past and Present. Um, today's lecture, we'll be looking title suggests at the typologies of the ethnic, the cosmopolitan, and the modernist within the arts and cultural landscape of early 20th century Europe, investigating the meanings and practices around these categories and typologies within the field of fashion. Um, so we really look forward to Georgia's lecture on that. Before I welcome Georgia to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll obviously have uh, questions from, from the audience. I'd also like to also invite you to join us um, 
downstairs in the canteen for Christmas drinks. Um, so please feel free to do that after the lecture. I'd also like to just quickly welcome two new postdoctoral research fellows who is joining train. That's Dr. Kimathi Bongo and Sitting Pante and Dr. Opi Lori. And we're very excited to have these two talented young researchers um, who will be joining train um, and giving us the benefit of their expertise and expanding the remit of train into very exciting um, areas. So we're excited about that. So we're also today celebrating um, our postdoctoral research fellows. Louise, as we might, Louise, by the way, it, Louise Beer is the um, person who organises the lectures, and she's the administrator for train, and she will not let she will not let me uh, pass without reminding me to please fill out at some point the uh, feedback form that you have because it helps us to make the uh, events, um, to, you know, to improve the events, and also it's really great to see that we've got new faces that come to tonight. So please continue to. Follow train. You can follow us on social media, Twitter, um, uh, Facebook, and also on the, on the internet. Um, so please keep in touch with us. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Georgia Bartlett for her first train lecture. Thank you, Georgia. Agency uh, fellowship, 
and really somehow position the manhwa in that times, especially within the arts and the applied arts. So she opened a, a fashion salon on the street Bolshoi Mitrovka in downtown Moscow, very central street. In, in 1885, she was 24. Uh, and then the beginning of her career coincided with what is known as the Silver Age in Russia, uh, in Popas, uh, covering the period between 1890 and 1917. And it's called the Silver Age because uh, in comparison to the Golden Age of Pushkin and other poets of the early 19th century. So the aesthetic of the Silver Age was called the style modern, with its artists drawing upon the most uh, different range of cultures from the exoticism of the Russian Far East to the ancient Greece and Byzantine, as well as contemporary decadence. The, art the artists of the Silver Age believed that their role was to embellish the world and somehow to to create, or to, even to create its beautiful and more perfect version, and, and perfect version of the world. And, uh, and to achieve their goal, they somehow, um, similarly to the other movements and other artists uh, in the West, they promoted that uh, uh, synthesis of art and craft as a total work of art, or some handwork, and uh, somehow, that broadened vision of the art included everything now, uh, architecture, interior design, graphic work, illustration, stage and costume design. And um, actually the, the most uh, well-known representatives of the Silver Age was the world of the art group Mir Iskustva, which was founded in St. Petersburg in, uh, in 1899, and which, uh, uh, which became famous in the West uh, with the ballet company, <coughs> the Ballet Rus from 1909. So fashion fits in, in this Silver Age concept. Lamanova's work corresponded to this broad fusion of the arts and her impeccable dresses assisted Russia's drive towards modernization and new social stratification. In this sense, her affluent and sophisticated clientele include the Tsarist family, members of the wealthy bourgeoisie, and famous actresses. In 1908, a prominent architect of the still modern Nikita Lazarev designed Lamanova's mansion of Perstoy Boulevard. This is a large uh, center located street <coughs> divided into two carriageways by a wide park running along the whole length of the street. And some of this location proved that Lamanova in that relatively brief period from the 1885 to 1908 somehow um, increased her status and also her, her business activities. This is a huge mansion and, uh, and Lamanova, with, uh, with <coughs> well, this is the original image, it looks different today. And uh, Lamanova chose very interestingly she, she chose this architect, Lazarev, who was known for his restrained neoclassical designs, which was as aesthetic also part of the world of art. And he was an experienced architect. He already at that time designed two hotels. And um, also, um, this mansion is typical of multifunctional spaces, which uh, the rich people and new businessmen um, were building at that, at that time in Moscow. So they would be living at those uh, at those mansions, but also working and running their business from there. And in that sense, uh, Lazaro fully met his client's requirements, uh, spreading over four floors a series of re representational rooms for fashion shows and for receiving clients. Her workshop accommodating 20 seamstresses, her personal quarters, which is shared with her husband, Andrei, uh, Andrei Kayuto, who was the a lawyer by profession, but became director of the biggest insurance company of Russia and probably contributed towards the cost of this mansion. But also the mansion also contained the lodgings for her apprentices. So everything is going here. She was receiving clients. She was running her business. But what is very important, Lazarev designed this very simple neo neoclassical 
uh, facade, but also very modern, uh, very modern building because uh, it didn't get a lift, which was very unusual at that time in Moscow. So the, co the floors were not only connected by the, by the customary stairs, but also by, by the lift. So it was in a technologically advanced, advanced building. So as I already said, Lamanova's dresses uh, included uh, the Tsarist family in, in that period, late uh, uh, 1890s and early, early 20th century. And uh, you see here examples of, of still modern, of that phase of still modern, uh, running in parallel with art of war, still modern um, relied on the similarly on the sinuous lines and botanical motifs, similar to art of war. Its Western counterpart, and it, it is shown in, in these dresses for, for the wife of the Tsar Nicholas II. Um, in, in the 1910s, Lamanova regularly visited Paris, and according to her, had written a short biography, which I, which I found in the, in the Central, uh, Central Archive in Moscow, Central Archive for Arts and Architecture, uh, Arts and Literature in Moscow. Uh, she wrote in 1921 that short autobiography. She stayed during every visit, she would stay for two months in Paris. So she was well informed, she knew what was going on, and she and she uh, would somehow follow 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 the expectations and she met many people during her visits in Paris, including Paul Poiret, who would later, and I'll come to that, will actually show his uh, his uh, his uh, collection in nineteen in, in her mansion. What is interesting for me, actually, how, how uh, much Lamanova somehow um, really corresponded with, uh, with uh, still modern, with still modern, uh, still modern aesthetic. And this is, this is, this is her adoption of, of neoclassicism. Neoclassicism was one of the main aesthetics of still modern. Um, and of the world of our group, Bax and Benoit, Yagiyev, and so on. And actually, Bax and Serov, <coughs> very famous painter, they visited Greece in 1907. Many other artists visited Greece, and they were really impressed with Greece. And uh, somehow, they, uh, it all showed in their art. And, and somehow, this uh, also what contributed to that uh, popularity of neoclassical style. Was uh, Isadora Duncan who first visited Moscow in 1904, in December 1904, and uh, Paxt and Anna Paula and everybody was was at her first performance. She kept coming back to Russia and eventually had her ballet school uh, in uh, in Moscow. Um, so um, somehow, oh, on on that uh, the right the, the right image shows the. The, the, this white coat and gown, which Romano executed for the actress Vera Karakan in the early tens, and somehow perfectly embodying this neoclassical Satorian style, but still having all these ornaments in uh, botanical ornaments in, in, in white, embroidery in white. And Vera Karakan, she was uh, a very famous actress in the 1910s, and she, she was a beautiful woman, and she married a rich man who eventually became a prominent Bolshevik afterwards. So she really <coughs> was able to dress uh, very fashionably both before the revolution and as her husband became a diplomat, she also dressed fashionably in the 20s and actually Lamanova did many of her dresses. And uh, I had I the had opportunity to, to study all those dresses in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And, uh, Incredibly, in 1971, her then curator, Madame Boshunova, traced 42 dresses by, by uh, not only by Lamanova, Karakan's wardrobe, and some by, by Lamanova, others well, by Poiré, by uh, Kalodusers, by, uh, by other French designers, Pakan as well. So this dress belongs uh, to, uh, to, this style belongs to that neoclassical um, aesthetic, but on the other hand, very important, um, very important part of, of the of the silver age, very important part 
of, of that, at least 16 in the 1910s, was the so-called uh, um, symbolist painters group called the Blue Rose. And you see here an example of, of um, their famous painter called, called Konstantin Sonov, who was also a member of the World of Art group. And we see that actually Lamanova designs practically dress which looks very, very much like, like that song of painting. So meaning adopting again one of the aesthetics and applying them on the dress design. And as, as um, the, blue, the, blue or the blue rose group, they, they were somehow influenced by the forests. They blew the lines of, of their, of, of blew the lines. So the things are relatively clear, these paintings. They have much more blurred paintings, but more towards the abstract. Uh, and so the same, uh, the Romanova does the same, he, sort of with those layers of transparent fabrics. And, um, and somehow this is new dress in the way that it is corset to this dress. And somehow these layers make it all fluid due to both of those factors. The fabrics are transparent and also there is no corset. One of um, Lamanova's famous clients was, uh, was a Fibia Nosova who, who comes from one of those rich families, in, uh, entrepreneurial new rich families at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, she comes from the family <coughs> Pchinsky, her brother was actually um, uh, sponsor of the blue, of the blue um, rose symbolist group, and he also had his own magazine which was called um, uh, Golden Fleece, which published their work. And uh, this is Konstantin uh, Somo, again the same painter, and painting this very rich woman who he admires very much in his diary. He paints her in a Lamanova dress. And uh, somehow what is very important to say at this point is that somehow that these uh, this radical new artistic practices uh, either neoclassicism, blue rose, and so on. They, they somehow were taking place within, within wider, uh, within wider uh, uh, equally significant changes in Russia's social and cultural life. And uh, especially, for example, through women like, uh, like Nosova, what we see is somehow that um, the, there is a new class on the scene. Pre before that, on the, on the public scene, you have only two classes, either aristocracy, and, uh, and their, uh, their privilege is, their uh, dignity is their privilege. And then you, you have intelligentsia, and they cultivated knowledge. So that was their capital of the intelligentsia. And now there is this new, new strata, this very, very strata, and they somehow, they, they have the money. And <coughs> somehow the merchant class, this class also, uh, whose Nosova is the member, they somehow, um, they somehow signify the, the arrival of capitalism, proper capitalism in Russia, not only because they are uh, in the main line of Australians, and even some women, and not many of them actually were text in, the, in the textile industry, but they, they, they also, uh, symbolize the arrival of new culture because they insist on spectacular and they insist on, on visual, on the visual. And this is somehow, this new economic system is, is very visual because they want to show off and they want to show off their wealth, their big houses. They are, they are very charitable as well. And some of the visual plays more and more important role in the Russian society at the beginning of the 20th century. And Lamanova perfectly fits that new culture because they want to be recognized, they want to, uh, to everybody to know about them, and somehow she she understands fluidity of of, um, of these new times in the end. She came herself from the provinces and actually advanced very very fast. Uh, and um, I must say also that she actually made her rich clients pay dearly for for her dresses. For example, uh, in one memoir, um, uh, granddaughter, one of Lamanova's client from the 1910s, 
claims that Lamanova charged 1,000 golden rubles for each dress. And um, I found other evidence that the leading portrait for a painter, Juan Pizarro, charged 900 <laughs> rubles for, for his portrait. So meaning she really knew what she was doing. She knew that they had money. She knew that they wanted to be presented like that. And, and she presented them. And uh, for example, I read the memoir by this artist, Constantin Somov, and he says, it was very difficult to, to paint this Lamanova dress because it's so delicate, it's so intricate, and all that embroidery, I suffered doing it. But he liked very much, uh, very much uh, Nosova, and he, they went to Ballet together, it was all about showing off. And um, here's another example. This is the painter I mentioned, Van Pissel, who actually was the leading painter of, of, of that new class, but also he, he also painted the aristocracy. And what is interesting for me here is this is his portrait on the left of um, Gerdieta Gishman, who was um, wife of <coughs> another, uh, another leading industrialist, Vladimir Gishman. And she's here presented as a very self-confident <coughs> woman, but she's presented through her belt. On the other side, Sarah also did portrait of Romanova, and she actually looks as a professional woman. She doesn't look, obviously, having that mention and charging that price if she had the money, but she is presented probably because she wanted to be presented as a, as a businesswoman, like she's just doing something, and then he, he finishes her, he finishes. He, he's painting her. And actually, he never finished this portrait of Romano Lancero because he died in 1914. And he complains in his diary that she was all the time in Paris or with me and there, and he couldn't finish her portrait. So, um, so actually, he. But her portrait, what is interesting again, was at the, his posthumous um, exhibition in Moscow. There were 500 works, and Lamanova was among, most of them were portraits, and Lamanova was among that uh, entrepreneurial class, aristocracy, and so on. So somehow, she was not only dressing them, dressing them in those wonderful clothes, but she was also somehow recognized as one of the people there, just because she was painted by the same artist, by their favorite same artist. But, but uh, here is to show that actually, Lamanova was not unique because uh, she was unique because she was closer to the artistic community, and I will talk more about that. But actually, the Russians in like Moscow, St. Petersburg, they knew about Paris fashion. And here are at the bottom are two, two uh, uh, outfits by Ward and Bakan. So they were well informed, and they were well informed about the rituals as well. And you see those are, again, the dresses of modern uh, Faulkner shape without corsets and so on. So somehow, Lamanova as well was moving with her time, somehow uh, squashing her, her silhouettes from the end of the 20th century in a very short period, as fashion did everywhere, into, into, into this, this very, very basic simple shapes. Somehow, having that innate understanding of change which each fashion designer should have. Very briefly to introduce Paul Poiré, who founded his fashion house in Paris in 1903, after working for two leading Paris high fashion designers, Jacques Doucet and, and, and Charles Worth. And um, Poiré is, has been most um, um, best known for his orientalist designs, which he developed in parallel or slightly after the Ballet Russe Ballet Scheherazade. But his most radical achievement was his abolition of the corset in 1906 and the invention of the so-called chemise dress in, uh, in, in, uh, in 1910. But was not uh, was not the only designer who, who to promote the uncorseted figure. He was the, among the first to link it to natural, naturalism of Greek or Roman dress. And this is very interesting, those two images. On the left is Leon Park's fashion illustration from 1910. And on the right, actually, the same pose by, uh, uh, in, uh, in this uh, picture by Edward, 
Okay, but um, cited the famous fashion photographer in that French journal, Art and Decoration, Decoration, which that journal actually dealt really only with fine art. So it was incredible that they had 20 pages uh, dedicated to, to Poiret's fashion. And uh, what is interesting, reading Poiret's biography, he always says, I never did not even one dress after some of the Zell's designs. But on the other hand, first we see here the similarity, which is incredible, but also I found uh, information from a letter in the um, manuscript, manuscript department of the Vetebo Gallery, in which Pax writes, they have his personal, personal archive there, in which he writes that for in 1910 bought 12 drawings, this is this time, from him, and then he paid 12,000 francs for them. So obviously, Poiré, who was writing biography somehow, establishing his legacy, I wouldn't believe him. I would rather believe Vax, because reading many of his letters to his family, he was always honest. He was writing only, only, only to his family. So probably that's how, how what happened. So that really, Poiré, occasionally at least, did did use other, other designers' drawings, especially Bach's. So this is, this is for again, he, he wanted to present himself as, as an artist and as, as patron and the patron of the arts. So he promoted fashions as uh, unique and original works of art. And here are two like luxurious booklets with his fashions by two, by two leading uh, French uh, artists of the, of the illustration. And somehow we see what is very new at that time, somehow that those are scenes from uh, like everyday life of smart, smart ladies, like talking, uh, gossiping, sitting in the drawing room and so on. So there are many more like so-called everyday, everyday scenes. This is the, this is the, this is the, again the same for a uh, article from Art and Decoration, published in 19, 1911. It's called Art, Art of Dress, and on the right is his wife. In she is uh, she is she's dressed in one of those very very simple colonial dresses, and uh, that picture was taken in Hotel Plaza in New York when they stayed there. For a already, was already a big star. And he somehow, at that time, he already very swiftly abandoned his oriental phase. And he returns to these more simplest of forms. And at that time, he, in an article to American Vogue, um, in the autumn, published in the autumn 1913, Poiré declared, the quote, in dressing Madame Poiré, I strive for omission, not addition. It is what a woman lives of, not what she puts on, that gives her cachet. And the article was called the prophet, the prophet of Simplicity. So to introduce Natalia Mocharo, my third protagonist, um, she was born in the province of Tula uh, at her family's estate, meaning that she, uh, she comes from, uh, from the nobility, but impoverished, so her father was eventually taking, the, she was a professional working for, for salary. And she moved to Moscow in 1892 to study sculpture, but then she moved to painting, after me, especially after meeting a fellow student, uh, uh, Mikhail Larionov, in, 19, uh, in the very beginning of the 20th century. And what is important to say is that Lamanova was a very different new woman in comparison to the wealthy entrepreneur's wives. Somehow because she was usually dressed in the bohemian style and occasionally even wore a pantsuit, I'll show the image of that. But also furthermore, Gocharovas and um, Larionov's relationship was not sanctioned by the marriage certificate, which was a big scandal in Moscow, both considered as a big scandal by the church and, and by, the, by the society. But also she, she had an equal relationship with Larionov and she developed in, in um, uh, she was somehow allowed the space to develop her talent and ambition to a previously unpresented level for Russian women artists. In her 1913 
perspective, for example, she exhibited more than 1,000 works. Um, and also, what is important to say is that Mikhail Larionov, Goncharova, um, and they are similarly minded Futurist avant-garde artists, participated in a number of swiftly developing and equally swiftly disappearing art trends. Cubism and Futurism, for example, developed in Russia into different branches like Kubo Futurism, Ryzen, and Suprematism. And also, they engaged different, this, this different branches of the art movements, uh, engaged different artists from Marievich to Tatlin, Goncharova, Larionov, Lyubov, Alexander Exter, and many others. At the same time, these artists somehow understood, they were Russian Futurists, but they understood the same the same motto which, which guided other, other avant-garde, many other avant-garde artists, especially Marinetti. They understood that scandal is capital. So they, they, did, they did various uh, uh, extraordinary events on the streets of Moscow and somehow obstructed, obstructed established bourgeois rituals. And um, they even were either Accused of immoral behavior, or they, they led provocative public debates. They they somehow positioned themselves at the at the margin of, of the polite society, and that's where they wanted to be. So, as much as they admired the exciting Western urban uh, rituals and were part of them, because, for example. Uh, Lariono already traveled with Yagilev to Paris in 1906, and from 1913, both Lariono and Gocharova worked for Yagilev uh, in Paris and his valets. But somehow, as much as they were very informed about the uh, exciting Western trends, they also depicted, and they depicted elements of the Western, Western uh, culture in, in their paintings. They also were influenced by the, uh, by the, and they were influenced by the Western avant-garde artists. But also their imagination fed on, on the Russian, on the Russian uh, popular art, from the from the icons to the traditional highly colored Lyubki prints. While the icons were religious, sacred images, the Lyubki ironically depicted uh, scenes from the everyday Russian reality, and. Uh, the way the ordinary people, especially the countryside, experienced the everyday, the everyday, everyday life. And there were many among the, those uh, avant-garde artists, from Larionov to Mariusz to Kandinsky, actually collected Lyubki and collected icons and very much relied on them. So, for example, Goncharova painted portraits, peasant life, religious subjects, flowers, and landscape, engaging with tradition of Russian ethnic art and Byzantine. For example, also Kandinsky, he writes one essay in, uh, in uh, published in 1918 that he was still in Russia on, on the spiritual in art. And he was a member of one ethnographic in 1889. He was a member of one ethnographic uh, expedition to the north, to the very north of, of Russia. And then he said that actually visiting a peasant's room with all the colors and prints and everything that actually he totally changed, he totally changed his vision of the world and his, his future art when, when he recalled about that later. So this is, this is just, that you see what Charles was said, I think, uh, this is, uh, this is her notebooks are uh, uh, preserved in, uh, in the archives department of the Bibliothèque Kandinsky in Centre Pompidou in Paris. And uh, here we see how she studies very, very deeply. Here, here this is about Kokoshnik. And Kokoshnik is a headwear worn by the young girls before, before they get, get married traditionally. And here she traces its origin to Persian. She really digs deep. She reads a lot of literature at that time in the 1910s, covering a range of cultures from the ancient Greece to Persian, Byzantine, and medieval Russian. But we see also how he, how she is very much in tune with the Western trends. And the painting on the left, she was actually, um, uh, that painting caused a lot of scandal in, in, 
Moscow and she will be on the exhibition I intend because because of the nude and she was uh, she was tried and eventually acquitted. So there was all the scandal around her. And on the right you see actually this very futurist, very futurist painting. And uh, then she had that big retrospective in 1913. Uh, so uh, Ilya Stanovich, another futurist of Georgian religion, uh, he wrote under the pseudonym Elena Eli Egan Buiri, he wrote um, uh, the catalog, he wrote the text for the catalog of her retrospective. And he says that, so in that very short period that he actually that she actually painted, which was 19, only 1913, that she also he divided her work into impressionist, cubist, primitive, futurist, and rice phases. So she really, she really somehow um, tried many things and somehow really has been the member of, of that fluid trans trans transcultural, not really transnational. She felt it Russian, but somehow uh, she had that uh, that uh, cosmopolitan existence, knowing everything what was going on and being interested in everything. And here we see her in, in trousers, remarkably, in 1913. And on the on the right, it is Larionov's portrait of her, which which again is done like maybe in the cubist way because there is collage from from um, uh, from from uh, that ballet called the War, was ballet that she did for for the Miller. So, so this is now how they relate to 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 this uh, to the ethnic and to and to uh, mainly to the ethnic in fashion. Three of them. So this is this is uh, uh, Paul Poiret's tour. He, he in his autobiography, uh, he's always bombastic, and he says that in 1911, I quote. I organized a colossal enterprise which consisted in making the tour of the chief capitals of Europe accompanied by nine mannequins. These capitals included Berlin, Warsaw, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Bucharest, Budapest, Vienna, and Munich. And the quote following this journey, his dresses are totally translated East European exoticism for sophisticated Western public. So this is another, another, uh, uh, Another evidence of his of his tour. This is in Vienna and in Berlin. So what is uh, what is very important is here is on the left. It is his um, his um, show, which he always uh, presented himself in Saint Petersburg. It took place in a private theater because many aristocrats and rich people they had their own small private theaters. And on the right, again, there are, there are his models. He traveled in the car, he and his wife, Denise, traveled in the car. But uh, the mannequins traveled by the train, dressed in very smart, uh, cold uniforms, so it was all, all uh, very well organized. And somehow, um, he, when he comes to Moscow, he is, uh, so he is, uh, he presents his fashions in the in uh, Lamanova's mansion, and for example, one of the one of the world of art um, members, Igor Graber, writes to the painter and set designer Alexander Benoit, for change, for change, serve and die. He usually enjoyed last evening. Paul Poiret arrived here, bringing with him a dozen models and hundreds of gowns. They paraded through a suit of rooms at Lamanova's new palazzo. The devil knows how good it was. He arrives to be the book. Do not miss it. End of quote. So the presentations in Moscow took three days, and uh, actually uh, Serov, Serov uh, returned to take to take more pictures. And in his autobiography, he, he fondly reminds Lamanova and her husband, and they took him to Kremlin Museum. They took him to see Chukin's, Sergei Chukin's uh, collection of modernist French art, so he was very, very happy in Moscow. So what is interesting for me also is just working in, in the archives and museums. Paul presented his European tour as he always presented his work, as a mere promotion of his work and French, the French courtier, uh, high fashion, but actually he had business, business interests as well. For example, this dress on the right is uh, labeled you see on the left, this is dress from 
the Pesci show, he showed in Moscow. On the right is the same dress, it's in the in the Hermitage, it's labeled Anna Gimbus. So what I think is that actually he probably left a number of dresses to Lamanova and obviously to Anna Gimbus. He said this is what and Lamanova in Moscow. And they sold they probably paid for them and then sold them under their own labels. So actually he already started that business, which he then continued in the twenties in America. Somehow selling his prototypes and his dresses. Also, there was a big business with some of Lamanova's uh, seamstresses who privately copied those dresses for the clients who were not so rich, but still somehow deserved to wear those dresses. So this is somehow, this is the journal called The Woman's Cause, and this was a very progressive feminist journal. I must say that no author studying Russian feminism mentions this journal. And why? Because they have fashion in. So they just, although they were a very progressive journal, they really were fighting for women's rights, for women uh, to vote, for women to take positions in, in professions, uh, for women to study. But they also had fashion. And here I just chose two, two, two covers, Vin Poiré, which actually were published uh, yeah, after, after he, after he already left Moscow. So what is somehow interesting, although they had all those noble causes that they were fighting for, and they never wrote about Tsarist family, they, they, were, they really were very urban, like progressive journal, but just because they wrote about fashion, they somehow uh, were not, have not been worthy of, of study. So somehow Lamanov again, he is in that position that he can somehow lead those process, those negotiations between Russia and somehow Russia moving towards modernity through, through dress. Either because she, she dresses women with those privileges in her private life, in their private lives, but also she does a lot of work for theater. She started to work for theater in 1901. It was the Stanislavski theater, actually she, she she was still working with them in 1941 when she died. So somehow, what I also want to say is that, that this phenomenon of fashion, um, spectacular and modernist at the same time, was a useful device in the reformers' efforts to modernize, modernize the country. Again, that modernization practically only, only spread to the big cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg, and eventually other, other cities. And this is how somehow what happened, uh, how Poiré somehow adopted uh, some of, of Russian native motives upon his, upon his return. So he was captivated by the Russian native motives. And he, he brought home uh, huge amounts of embroidery towels, tablecloths, uh, embroideries, everything. And he made clothes for his wife, Denise. This is the same visit, and she took this tunic called Moscow. She took it in, in New York in 1913. And uh, somehow, what, what I think is very important for me to say is that for highly urbanized cosmopolitans such as Poiré, uh, Russia was an uncharted territory. So what he could do, he could enjoy the primitive. And he could come home, he could be modernist, and fashionable by simply transferring Russian ethnic motives on, on his new outfits. And uh, here is the, the dress which is now in the collection of Gaviera, again a dress by uh, Denis Poiré's dress. And uh, we see how simple that dress is. He, he has, this is Russian tablecloth, but he, he cuts that new, he cuts in that new simple cloth. Uh, the same with this dress called Kazan, again, uh, this is totally Russian towel, and he turned it into dress. So, um, the simple cuts of these outfits somehow show that for a resolutely appropriated, easy to wear, corset free sartorial references. But on the other hand, he used ethnic, and he had no problems using Russian ethnic. He, in this practice, even qualified him for learning as, as being modernist introducing these ethnic motives in, in high fashion. 
But my argument will be, and I should rush now, my argument should be, uh, uh, my argument is that, um, that actually La Manuela couldn't do the same. She just couldn't do basic Russian ethnic motives. And, and here's why, that um, with the World War I approaching uh, and that with inner contradictions uh, boiling before the surface in, in Russian society after the failed 1905 revolution, uh, somehow the Tsarist Russia was a very social and settled. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, somehow the Tsarist family didn't enjoy the, the, uh, the, the loyalty not even of, of, of their own nobility, and especially uh, not among the wider, wider, uh, wider society. So usually there would be the intelligentsia, revolutionaries who were against the Tsar, and they would be expelled from the country or in prison. But actually now we are entering the situation when, uh, after 1905, when actually many members of society from different social strata are not supportive of the Tsarist regime anymore. And here is actually earlier, earlier pictures, uh, when the Tsar, Nicholas II, organized this grand ball, and uh, when the Russian aristocracy dressed in like, uh, in new dresses, but which were designed according to historical, historical mobility costumes. So this is somehow, Historically, each and every Russian Tsar would somehow would contribute their own myth. And this is the time when actually, after Peter the Great and many other Tsars in the meantime, uh, Russia doesn't want to be anymore <coughs> under Nicholas II, like modern European country, like what's, what Peter the Great dreamed of. So this is like somehow myth of Nicholas II going back to like true Russia. He was, he was also very religious and so on. So what is, what is important that at that time, so we are talking now 1913, there is a 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty, dynasty, and there is a big exhibition with 6,000 exhibits of the ethnic art produced in all the parts of the country. And actually, uh, and the, part, uh, the patron of the exhibition was, was the the Tsarina, the, the, the Tsar's wife. And here we see somehow what they thought, what, what the Tsarist regime ideology they promote. This is like going back to very, very traditional style of dress. But on the other hand, uh, they also promoted exhibition promoted. Uh, the like um, so-called Ustari workshops, meaning peasants having cooperatives, uh, embroidering dresses, making dresses, actually trying to help them to survive and so on. But on the other hand, those artifacts were all new. They were not originally ethnic. So there was a lot of um, ambivalence about that big exhibition. And the progressive newspapers would say that actually it was only uh, promoting the, the Tsarist myth. It was not helping the, the countryside. And also that it was the narrative which actually only helped uh, the Tsar to rule, not exactly, uh, that, it, that it is not a modern narrative, so the other narratives appear along as well. And it's interesting to know, because I, I, nobody can say it. if if Poiret, for example, bought his towels and everything, table clothes, from those shops who, which were selling these goods, and there were probably, uh, maybe, you know, maybe 10 of those Kostari shops only in Moscow, or he maybe managed to get original, original, like table towels, table towels and table things. So as I said, uh, somehow this exhibition was uh, denounced, uh, like uh, progressive newspapers said, that, the magazine said that, it, that its hidden agenda was to monopolize the national narrative through its newly designed and thus fabricated ethnic artifacts in this, like, neo-nationalist style loose. And uh, actually, this fashion was also promoted to the shops. So whoever wanted, this is, this is the, the journal, uh, and, and, and the shop in St. Petersburg, where I could go and buy, and buy some clothes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Also, the, the, the other narrative, which is very modernist, was Sergei Chukin, uh, who, was, uh, who was one of those new entrepreneurs who managed to buy this, uh, uh, to go, who was also very, very, uh, very intense art collector, and he actually managed to uh, compose this big art collection. And I don't know if you know that right now, in the, in the Fantasy Foundation of Louis Vuitton in Paris, there's a big exhibition of his work, all united now. And, <coughs> and he amassed, I don't know, 50 Picassos, and you know, many more Matisses, and, and many, many other artists, Gauguin, uh, uh, and so on. And also in his house, he would, he would if at first he had Sunday mornings when everybody could come and respect it. So many artists, Russian or the others, they first have seen, have seen those uh, uh, French modern art in his house. But also Matisse came to visit, and, and uh, generally Shukin was very generous with, with his collection. And he, he somehow also had uh, those soirees which, uh, which organized by his wife, first, first wife, his first wife called Lydia, Lydia Chukina, who also was a marvelous client, by the way, and somehow she, those stories were very popular, everybody attended from Yogiev to, to uh, Shalyapin, the famous singer, to, to Alexander Benoit, to Anatoly Nachalsky, before he became the, the first education minister in the Bolshevik government, uh, Bolshev government, and so on. So somehow, this was this was the, like all people who were interested in the modernist arts, but also in modernity as such, they would gather at, at Shukit's house. But they also gathered at uh, at the Society for the Society of Free Aesthetics, which was founded in Moscow in 1907. And here again, the woman in the white is Gabriela Gishman. I already showed her portraits, and the, the artist uh, who did this this work is Leonid Pasternak, the father of the writer Boris Pasternak. And this is a concept because they this society, which was among others, second person standing on the right, is Vladimir Gishman, husband of Gianetta Gishman. And all those industrialists, they organized, they had other different societies, art societies, but this was like the, the best one and the most active one. And the people the guys turned with their backs on the right is Jagilev, and I think he's talking to Nachalski. So that many artists were members, Russian artists were members of this society, and they had exhibitions and, and the evenings, concerts. And also they, they had many, many foreign guests from, um, from uh, Debussy uh, to, to Marinetti to, uh, to uh, Matisse and so on. So, Somehow all of that was going on. I have to, I have to. So this is again those rich ladies who, who, uh, who, who somehow through dress were bringing modernity in Russia. And I have to, I, I know I have to rush, but then I have to tell you this anecdote. This is again Evgenia, Evgenia Nosova, and. Uh, there is, the, there is that incredible incident that happened. She was dressed in 1915 in Romanova's dress with a long train, and she attends the opening of the exhibition in, in, uh, in Mikhailova Gallery in Moscow. And she arrives to the first room, and there is this world by Tatlin. This is the first, first time that he showed this abstract, abstract work. And her train gets caught in, in this, in this, in the virus at the, at the, at the floor, and she's furious, <coughs> and she says, "What is this?" <laughs> and so, so then the organizer of the edition right, runs to Tatlin, "Please, please, move your work, move your work," and so, and then Tatlin totally offended him. So Lamano was even unintentionally included in in that little incident, and and those artists, but they somehow promote new narrative, and here we see. Ariono, La Procharo is in the middle. And as I said, they did, uh, they organized that exhibition target, where actually Ariono were missing. And he showed their work, but also his own collection of the, of the Russian popular art. 
And uh, in all those scandals that they would perform in the, in the streets of Moscow, they also painted their faces and Mayakovsky would wear a yellow jacket and so on. So they, they wanted to shock that, that proper society, that like proper society. But also what is important to say about this, so somehow that exhibition, 1913, was somehow presenting another narrative of Russian, another national narrative with those original works of popular art, not, not just that fabricated, fabricated story in St. Petersburg, that, that big Gustav exhibition. I can't talk about this, although this is very interesting. This is also how, how Lariano, how he somehow deals with, uh, with uh, and translates French, French, French work. And um, this is, this is uh, really Lama Pocharova, uh, and somehow what she, her work here, and in other paintings, is very similar to, to the art, her art that they show, because somehow she, she uses the Poiré lines, and actually she did these paintings in 12 and 13, so meaning after Poiré's visit. So the, the lines are those corner, simple lines. But she, she, she uses the same, uh, she uses the same like splashes of color, strong patterns, ethnic, and so on. So somehow she, she is again dealing with the ethnic, but also with the modernist, with fashion, but also also with uh, somehow the process which she applies in her art, she also applies here, somehow coping as a creative process. And why it's important? Because actually Lamanova buys, buys this, buys her, these drawings. And she exhibited these drawings of, of, of dresses and, and those patterns. She exhibited them in her retrospective. And what is very interesting for me is that Lamanova is listed in the catalog of that retrospective in 1913 as a person who bought 12 uh, drawings of the dresses, but also she bought one, one piece of art, one aquarel. So meaning she was even collector of this art which is very much contradicting the, the aesthetic of her clients, of rich industrialists, because they actually like symbolist artists. But Lamanova moves towards this, towards like this very, very avant-garde, avant-garde uh, part of, uh, of, of, the artistic, of the artistic scene. So somehow, um, uh, what is important to say is that for for uh, Macharova, that she combines here as well high and low, and somehow that she refers to high fashion, but also again in her way somehow desacralizing it. And this is even worse because this is not worse. I'm joking, and I, I, I'll finish first soon. So here, for example, she has, she shows this model with a very short hair, but actually only prostitutes would wear short hair like that in the 1910, 1911. And, but she also connects it somehow to ancient Greece. So she, again, she has many references in, in just, uh, and she somehow, as we see, she translates the references from from, uh, from her art to, to her fashion drawings, to her fashion drawings. So somehow, she, yeah, I, I think that her work somehow seemed, somehow uh, resembled uh, the, the functioning of the fashion system for, from its reliance on the past styles to in inventing new fashions to somehow clever uses of the copy. And Bajarova does it all the time. Uh, somehow, she's, she's somehow also disrespectful uh, towards the ethnic and sacred sources, and somehow also self promotional and 
havoc is all the decorative, something all of that can relate to fashion. So for example, this is how, how other artists from the same period, Rafi Shekuka, who is, is very important, although not uh, completely recognized in abstract art, this is his early work. And he again presents these dancer girls in Montmartre actually prostitutes. So very similar, very similar to Lamanova. So there is no evidence how Lamanova used those drawings, those 12 drawings that she bought. But, uh, no, nothing survived. But actually, probably she did the same dresses as, uh, as Poiré did for, for, for his wife, Denise, because she only did design dresses of those lines in, at that period. So probably she did similar dresses. But what is important, the most important for me, is somehow to say that Lamanova, she was Russian, and she couldn't use those basic, like, genuine ethnic motives. Because at that period, 1913, she could be considered retrograde, nationalist, and somehow her sophisticated, sophisticated clientele would understand that she is not modernist any longer. So somehow she relies rather on Bocharova and stay modernist. So unlike Poiré, who could be modernist, just transparent Russian ethnic motives as such, she had to somehow translate them in, into, into, to translate them into modernist kind of via Bocharova work to be able to be modernist in Russia and also to use, to, to somehow to become fashionable by, by relying on Bocharova's neo-primitivist neo, <coughs> uh, neo ethnic motives. Okay, so this is also, I, I will finish. Uh, uh, this is another example of, uh, of the artists, of the artists called uh, Evgenia Bebiskaya, who was also at that exhibition in St. Petersburg, but this is a, a yet another narrative. She actually promoted uh, the ref reform dress, which was popular everywhere in Europe as well, in Germany, especially in Germany. But she, she somehow used purified ethnic motives and Russian ethnic motives, especially Ukrainian, and used them in, in, in those clothes. And uh, this is really the very end. In 1915, there was an exhibition um, called, uh, uh, called the Exhibition of Decorative Arts. And actually, this was the first time when, uh, when the abstract artists like Mayevich and Alexandra Exter and others, when they, and, and then applied artists, and the sky herself, who I mentioned in the last slide, when they actually did abstract patterns in the, in using them, like embroidering them in, uh, in, uh, in everyday, in everyday objects. And that exhibition was uh, uh, really reviewed very much. I, here are just two examples. But somehow, uh, uh, this, uh, this interest in the modernist uses of the ethnic is, is visible here. And again, Lomanova, Lomanova is there, and she buys some objects at that exhibition. And for me, again, it means that somehow she, of course, she is well off, and this exhibition in the gallery of Le Marcier in, in Moscow. Because interestingly, there were two galleries, and both were owned by women, Gallery in Karlova and Gallery Le Marcier. And Le Marcier was more towards decorative arts. And uh, Lamanova, of course, that exhibition was specifically targeting the upper middle class, so of, they could afford those objects. And uh, like, like well, wanting to change and somehow improve interior design, in, in Russia, and Lamanova buys some objects. But again, it's interesting for me that, of course, she could afford it, but just choosing to buy objects there, I also find this significant. So somehow, just to finish, some of the medium of the medium textile and embroidery uh, to which avant-garde artists, such as Malevich and Exter and others, the medium, this medium, to which they chose to present that dimension of a new form of artistic language, somehow 
corresponds with, uh, with uh, Romanova in her everyday yet innovative practice of, of um, inventing new dress. And somehow, at the time, at that time, both, both art and fashion somehow cultivated that innate understanding that only a radical innovation could bring a real change in the everyday. And so we, we, we very much regard to a new geometrical shape dress. Thank you. So So I didn't find any evidence that the two of them were specifically related. But yes, Gonchanova actually had the very, very same aesthetic. Somehow applying, uh, uh, Gonchanova was Ukraine, Ukrainian by region, although she grew up in St. Peter, Petersburg. But uh, actually she, she applied the same somehow uh, strategy of uh, purifying ethnic motives and then applying them on dress. So this is a good question, yeah. Yeah, it is, there are a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. And there were other people, I just chose two, you know, these people, and I even couldn't manage them in my time frame. So there are many other similarities. I mean, other people who did it, but Sonia Delay is the best example, that's true. Yeah, I mean, my name is, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, can I pick your uncle and search uh, fellow? I find a really interesting parallel in what you're saying with um, sort of representation of African artistic identity at the sort of same time frame around the sort of age of imperialism, really, and this notion that um, you know this European modernist artists could appropriate motifs from African art and this would sort of um, guarantee their modernity, as it were, but. In Africa itself, the same motifs were regarded as signs of, sort of primitive chauvinism or too much um, you know, closeness to the past. And I think that parallel with what you identified in Russia with the, um, the way that uh, is, um, the bourgeoisie identified ethnic Russian motifs with czarist sort of, you know. Um, they were trying to monopolize a certain narrative. It's a really interesting sort of parallel there, I think, about how the same motifs can have a completely different sort of meaning depending on the politics or the political position of these. It's yeah. You see, and there's this parallel between what's happening in the Russian Empire and what's happening in, say, the British and French Empire. Yeah, yeah, true. Good to know. I mean, this is my interpretation, actually. I Nobody else said it. Yeah, well, the, as I said, Romano has a mythical status, so a lot of, it's a lot written about uh, 
there's lots of text about her, but they're mostly sort of devaluing her, you know, just sort of laudatory. They just ask, they don't analyze her work. So it's really my interpretation. And because I was really intrigued, why, when did she chose Rocharo, which was so out of her social circle? And I, I totally, I think that's why. Because really, I mean, just reading historical about the Russian Empire, uh, the Russian Empire, really the, the Tsar didn't understand. That's why the Bolshevik Bolshev came in. He didn't understand, didn't really understand the historical circumstances. And he just drew more and more to himself. And in the end, uh, the nobility and the close relatives of the Tsar killed Rasputin. So, you know, just, the, and, and on the other hand, he drew it to himself and really pushed so intensely that narrative of like medieval Russia. So, so yes, I mean, uh, probably there are, that's very interesting for me to know. So I think it's a time on the, somehow on the right, <laughs> or on the right path. Thank you very much for your uh, very informative talk. I'm Yuko Kikuchi, I'm a core member of TRAIN. Um, uh, it was uh, very informative in a way that there are modernities, plural modernities, and you were talking about Russian uh, location and modernities um, in that location and crossover between avant-garde art movement and the speculative arts and fashion, um, and also this various reference to uh, Byzantine and Russian Greece and folklore and so on. Um, my uh, interest is in Russia, a very big country, and then your talk was framed um, between uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Paris, and West Side, you are referring to. But Russia has got East Side too, and uh, um, there is an interesting modernist avant garde movement in Radio Stock. And they served Radio Stock uh, modernism came to Shanghai and Japan, and another metropolis, Shanghai and Tokyo, are uh, connected. And uh, uh, in Japan, there was a very interesting exhibition called uh, Modernism in the Russian Far East and Japan that was held in tw uh, 2002, and it became a really, really news making uh, exhibition because we learned a lot how Tokyo's modernism of the same uh, period, 1910s and 20s, are connected to eastern side of Russian and uh, um, uh, Russian avant-garde movement. And so um, you, you mentioned Pore, and uh, Pore uh, is uh, connected in different way with Japan and China. And also that's your talk of uh, this Russian Modernism is uh, um, connected through Vladivostok to Tokyo. And uh, there are several artists came to uh, Tokyo, like Burduk and uh, Parimov. And one another lady, uh, uh, female artist who was very, very important in Tokyo's modernism was uh, Varvara uh, Pugnova. Um, I wonder Sorry, if I didn't get your name. Varu I can't pronounce very well, but Varvara Pugnova. Okay. Uh, we, we oh, you mean this is the Russian, the Russian artist? Yes, she's okay. uh, trained in uh, uh, Saint Petersburg. So, okay. and with the same group you were talking about, uh, this you know, shared group. So, I was wondering, <laughs> um, do you have any uh, comment on the East Side connection of your talk and any other information uh, through your research? Thank you. This is really important. And I, I know as much as you said. I don't know very much. I don't know much more, and I didn't study it. But uh, as you said, it, it, Russia in today, but especially then, when it was that empire, it, it's a huge country. And uh, I really concentrated on, on this part. But yes, the, and I know that exhibition, I didn't see it, but I've seen the cattle. I, uh, there were interesting things going in many of, at the edge of the empire the eastern side of the empire. And also, for example, Georgia had incredible modernism. Georgia, you know, today Georgia, which was then part of, of the Russian empire. And I mentioned Ilya Zdanyevich, he was, he, was, he was one of the leading Georgian modernists who then eventually moved to Moscow. 
was a little bit left for us. So yes, I'm aware of that, but they have been specifically studying. But it, this only proves that how transnational all that field is, that it goes from Moscow, and then we are for a in Paris, but then we are for a again to Japan because he also was influenced by Japan and by China, and so on. I, I only talked about his Russian, Russian influences. But the story was really, he, wherever he went, he was buying and buying and dragging to his studio, and he was sort of full of ideas and all this, designing either Chinese like robe or Oriental Middle Eastern robe or Japanese robe. Because also, he, all those cuts are in the end geometrical and very basic. So it suited him, those, those shapes suited, suited his own aesthetic. It's, it's really interesting. And I, I, I don't think I will have time to study it more in depth, but I can refer to it. So thank you so much. I'm Mike Lundman. I'm also a member of Trent and a reader here at Chelsea. Um, I, I was very interested in, in the way you described the kind of uh, the coexistence of several different kind of models of modern aesthetics in the 1910s. And, I, and the question I have is, is whether you uh, bring that research uh, a bit further on, in, maybe into the 20s, when when following both the revolution and the First World War, when there seems to be a kind of a, a filtering out in different kind of nationalist contexts of that very kind of 1910s metropolitan, uh, cosmopolitan modern elite, uh, and, and, and the, that kind of multiplicity of the models of modernity of a, a modern aesthetic seems to me anyway to, to, to become uh, kind of become kind of different national or nationalist styles uh, following the, the, the First World War. There's a kind of a return, I mean, in France, in France they called it the return to war. Yeah. And I, I'm, I would be quite curious to see how, how that transition from this kind of multiple cosmopolitanism to models of modern national or nationalist models uh, happened over that transition. And I just wondered if you had done any work in that direction. Well, I did, I did work on the whole 20th century, so I'm familiar with that. Uh, but also, you know, when we say cosmopolitan, it's really, it's important to aware that the rich people were the first cosmopolitans because they, they, they had the means to travel, they, they, they had the means to get educated, they had the means to spend time in Paris or here, there, so. Uh, yes, and there is a big difference, especially in France, but also in other countries after the First World War, but mostly in France, because France was really very, how to say, injured by that situation, being defeated, you know, I mean, not defeated, but seriously, seriously attacked by Germany and so on. And Poiré himself was the victim, was the victim, and he was accused at the very beginning of the First World War, he was accused that he had Munich taste, so he had really to defend himself prove himself as a French and, and uh, within that narrative. And actually, nobody writes about that. But I discovered that letter, Poiré's letter uh, to Delaunay. Interestingly, because the Russians, I don't know if there's anybody here Russian or French, but those two nations, they somehow, they somehow presented their narrative nationality, always somehow the best light. So I found, I was working at the same time, it was more or less on the, scale, on the same documents, related to Sonia Delaunay in Paris, when, when the people who organized that big exhibition, which was first in Paris and then in Tate Modern, they were working at the same time. And I'm sure they've seen those letters, but they don't mention it. And actually Poiré had a big fallout with Delaunay, because Delaunay wanted to work with him, she was, going into fashion business. And, and Poiré sent her an angry letter because the owners were living first in, in Portugal and then in France during the First World War. And then he said, you are traitors, you left France. So probably he did it 
to somehow to defend himself, to, to strengthen his position. I'm the French, and I'm in Paris, and would they look at you deserters? Uh, yes, but uh, I, I, I don't see, I know what you mean, and it is uh, well known, you know, it is well known almost official narrative. Uh, Ken Silver and some other, some other um, art, art critics who, who follow like that modernist part, as they say, towards again classical and so on, and in Picasso, and everybody becomes classical, not not avant-garde any longer. But I, I see it more happening towards the. I mean, it it was happening, but on the other hand. There are probably other reasons, not only ideology, why why they why their aesthetics or anyone's aesthetics could change. But uh, this phenomenon that you talk about, I see it more towards uh, take place towards the be beginning of the Second World War, when actually each nation closes into itself, and really you have, uh, especially in fashion, and then coming back to it, you really have nationalist somehow aesthetics, and modernism is nationalized as well, somehow. So, yes, but yeah, you are right. You are right, because, yeah, maybe not immediately after the, after the First World War, but yes, in the mid-20s, for example, at the big exhibition in Paris, at the big exhibition of applied arts in Paris in 1995, all those new countries, like East European new countries, so Central European, from Czech Republic to Poland to Hungary, they all presented themselves through through their like new invented ethnic ethnic aesthetic, but um, not so much in France. Was about, again when it comes to the field of fashion, because France presented itself at that exhibition when it comes to fashion as like uh, modernist modernist luxurious country and so on. Yeah, many things were going on. Okay, um, I've got a question actually as well. <laughs> but perhaps we'll now not soon. Just a quick question, maybe I'll, <coughs> if you hear me. Um, Georgia, I was quite interested in the kind of interplay between items of fashion and works of art at that time. Um, and thinking about the kind of subversive potential, obviously we know that obviously modernism was you know became quite a revolutionary movement. It was associated uh, with you know, revolution, etc. And what in how did fashion play into that? And into, I know that you've written quite a lot about the subversive potential of um, the subversive nature of fashion within uh, that in the socialist context, but in this pre-revolutionary context. Was fashion seen as something which was destabilizing? Was it seen, you know, I'm quite interested, I guess there's two parts of the question. One was how did it relate to the, to visual arts? Because you mentioned quite a few exhibitions, applied exhibitions where they were maybe shown together. And then what was the subversive potential of fashion? Uh, well, uh, uh, it was subversive because somehow it was offending the established Conventions. So, for example, if Goncharova is not married, or if she has like nude painting, it is it is offensive. Also, if she designs the clothes which are like not conventionally feminine, it is again subversive. Because as everywhere else, actually, uh, the the beginning of the 20th century was a time of big change with a new woman coming onto the scene. So there was a big discussion on the concept of femininity in Russia at that time. And especially, I had no time to talk about it, especially focusing on, focusing on the role of, of the art actresses, famous actresses. And I showed only Vera Karaka, but there were many of them. And somehow they were between, in that liminal space, between respectful, because they, they would be respected when they were at the stage. But on the other hand, their position was not respectful in the society. But on the other hand, they exactly they were promoters of fashion. So somehow the fashion would move from, from that disrespectful space into respectful 
through the medium of, of actresses. And then somehow that concept of feminine was somehow very much destabilized because of, of all these vectors which were drawn in a different direction because the Orthodox Church had its own ideas, the Tsarist regime had its own ideas, avant-garde had its own ideas. So, so it was, I don't think that it was subversive. It, it was a revolution, but not in the Bolshevik way a revolution. It was a revolution in, like, socially. And then what did the purpose of the second part? No, that, that's really what was asking at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions before we um, round up? Um, just before I thank Georgia, um, just to say that the next train lecture, the first of the next year, um, is on, on the 18th of January, and um, it will be, uh, I think it'll be a really interesting lecture, Dr. Azadir Fatarad, who is a photographer and a researcher, and it's called Photography, Desire, and Resistance in the Minds of Women Following the 1979 Revolution in Iran. That's the 18th of January here at Chelsea, so if you're uh, available, please come to that. Let me just uh, also invite you to come downstairs for a uh, Christmas drink and some pies. But most importantly, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Georgia Bartlett for um, a really rich tapestry, if I may say. Um, um, it, it, it's kind of a window into her, into her research. And also, I think it's a really exciting um, direction for train to, um, to really engage. So thank you so much, Georgia. Thank you.